Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. Thanks for joining us for tonight's special sex ed program. I'm Claudia Besser. I'm the director of public programs here. And um, I guess I should let you all know that tonight's program might not be for everyone. It might get a little bit racy. We might be using some explicit language. So if that's not for you, I leave it to you to decide for yourself if you think this is right for you. Now, with that out of the way, we can move onward and upward. Sex is in the news right now, and it's opening up a lot of questions about who gets to have sex and when and how and with whom. And of course, we all know that sex is always in the news and always will be in the news. But right now, with the outing of rapists in the Me Too movement, the mass shootings by incels, political sex scandals, and stories of just plain old awkward and bad sexcapades like in the cat people story in The New Yorker, um, everybody is talking about sex. So it seems like a really good time to have an open dialogue about sex and what makes for good sex, rather than all the negative things we've bombarded with in the news. So tonight we want to talk about real, consensual, awesome sex with three women who have made it their profession to celebrate sexuality in a holistic way. It's the great time for the launch of a new educational web platform called The Sex Ed, which has the following wonderful mission statement. The Sex Ed's mission is to cultivate a deeper understanding, openness, and acceptance of sexuality, health, and consciousness. The Sex Ed is a holistic, intersectional platform of dynamic sex education resources and tools that inform, inspire curiosity, and provide audiences with a safe ecosystem to ask questions and seek expert advice. So the Sex Ed is the brainchild of Liz Goldwyn, who told me a few years ago that she was thinking about writing an advice column about sex, and now it's blossomed into this much bigger endeavor. Her professional career has long involved sex education. From 93 to 95, she worked with Planned Parenthood, first here in Los Angeles, where she was a teenager, when she was a teenager, educating other teenagers about sexually transmitted diseases and sex education. And then later on in New York City, helping Planned Parenthood with fundraising, outreach, and establishing a video library. And I can guess what might have been in that library. Um, Goldwyn has spent over two decades researching and studying sexuality, having directed a documentary called Pretty Things about burlesque and striptease, and written a book on the same topic called The Last Generation of American Burlesque Queens, as well as a novel called Sporting Guide, set in the world of vice and prostitution. So this new digital platform seeks to cultivate a deeper understanding, openness, and acceptance of sex. Um, Liz is also a writer, filmmaker, and artist living and working in LA. Her short films include Underwater Ballet, LA at Night, The Painted Lady, Dear Diary, Love Meditation, and Cello Dream. She's contributed to publications including the New York Times Magazine, the Financial Times, British Vogue, and Vanity, Affair, Vanity Fair. <laughs> Freudian slip there. Hmm. Um, <laughs> So many vanity affairs out there. Uh, she was the New York editor of French Vogue, and she had a column in the Japanese magazine Hana Tsubaki, and was a guest editor of Town & Country. She's also a fashion icon whose incredible sense of style graces the pages of every magazine and newspaper. She was hired as a consultant and curator, curator for Sotheby's newly created fashion department while she was still in college, and she's been commissioned as an artist and designer by MAC Cosmetics, Van Cleef & Arpel, Altamont Apparel, and Le Bon Marché. In the museum sphere, she's worked on a Patrick Kelly retrospective at the Brooklyn Museum of Art and curated a documentary series at LACMA. Um, and in 2014, she founded Vintage Vanguard with her partner, Karen Elson, and it's a philanthropic foundation for women's issues. And she's going to be the moderator of tonight's discussion. Liz has invited two truly extraordinary women here tonight. Her first guest is Nina Hartley. Nina started her, her award-winning career in adult entertainment on stage in 1982 and on screen in 1984. Hers is the longest continual career of any woman in porn history, and she remains active in front of the camera. She's also a fierce advocate for the right that for the idea that sexual freedom is a fundamental human right. And she's on the board of directors of the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Alliance. She speaks regularly around the country using her nursing degree, she's actually a registered nurse, to educate people about the importance of sexual sanity, literacy, pleasure, and health. Along with her husband, 
I.S. Levine. She wrote Nina Hartley's Total Guide. Oh, so sorry. She wrote Nina Hartley's Guide to Total Sex, which is a companion book to her 40-volume sex ed series on DVD called the Nina Hartley Guides. Our second guest is Dita Von Teese. Von Teese is a burlesque dancer, model, actress, singer, costume designer, and entrepreneur, and kind of all-around goddess. Her full-length reviews, um, The Art of the Tease and Burlesque Strip Strip Hooray, are the biggest touring burlesque shows in history and regularly play to sold-out crowds around the world. Her book, Your Beauty Mark, The Ultimate Guide to Eccentric Glamour, is requisite reading for pin-up burlesque and fashion fans across the globe, and it's a New York Times bestseller. In addition to her burlesque shows, she's a fashion icon and muse and has launched her own lingerie collection, hosiery line, luxury gloves collection, and a new fragrance called Scandalwood. She released an album this year with composer Sebastien Tellier, and she's an advocate in the fight against HIV and AIDS, working with MAC, H&M, and AMFAR to raise money for AIDS research and awareness. So now let's get into it. Please join me in welcoming Liz Goldwyn, Nina Hartley, and Dita Von Teese. everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I hope we're not going to offend anyone with our language, but I figured we should just get it out of the way right now. So, fuck, fuck, cock, twat, pussy, pussy, <laughs> cunt, anal, <gasps> anal, anal. <laughs> All right, is everyone, word, is everyone relaxed? That's Latin. <laughs> So since we're here to talk about sex ed tonight, I want to know from both of you sex goddesses, what was your first sex ed experience? My first sex ed experience was um, the Berkeley Barb in 1968, where I saw my first naked breast in a photograph of people dancing topless in People's Park. Uh, but it was the 70s in Berkeley, so the books were there everything you want to know about sex, but we're afraid to ask. Sensuous man, sensuous woman. And the big one, of course, happy hooker and joy of sex. And porn. How old were you? I was 14 when I started reading those books, and they were very, very influential on me because I realized I didn't have the words then, you know, queer, bisexual, non-monogamous, but it was all of those things. And so the 70s were a very hopeful time about sex where actually men and women were learning to come to come together and, and, and men were, were willing to be more free about sex and for women uh, primarily to have sex for their own pleasure and not just for someone else's approval or a request. Um, I think um, I was in like sixth grade, seventh grade, and I had a really slutty friend. And she was always, like, taking me to, like, her church camps and, like, making out with boys and encouraging me. Her church camp. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Lucky you. And, and she was also a little bit, like, there were a few, like, little, not, not I can't say lesbian experiences, but like, things that were a little bit borderline. Like, hey, should I, um, what color pubic hair do you have? Let's look at them next to each other, you know, things like that. But it's all very, it was all very, like, you know, I came from a small town in Michigan, and I moved out to California, and suddenly I met this girl. So it was a little bit, like, really, you know, kind of intense. But I loved having a slutty friend. She told me everything I needed to know. You Lucky know? you. I had no slutty yeah. friends. <laughs> Through a religious lens. Yeah, and then when I was, like... Um, in high school, I had a serious boyfriend, like through all, so I really feel lucky. I had all my, like, best, I had the perfect situation for experimenting with sex. It was like a relationship for five years between the age of uh, 15 and, and 20, so that was really That's fortunate. Idyllic. Yeah. So was there an aha moment for both of you when you were like, oh my God, I get to do s uh, something with sex professionally? Oh, yes. <laughs> 1976, Berkeley, California, imagine Big Mac overalls, flannel shirt, granny glasses, no makeup, waffle stompers underneath, beautiful matching semi-sheer bra and panty set, underwire front clothes. But no one ever saw that bra and panty but me, but I, they were there. And I snuck into my first adult movie. I'd read the book, Autobiography of a Flea. It was a costume 
book. And so there's a movie, ma I read the book, I wanted to see the movie. And in the, in the middle of the theater, I was all alone because I walked in and a single female in a porno theater, it's like soap and greasy water, all the men just, and I had the whole theater to myself. And in the middle of one of the scenes, I'd never, I'd barely kissed a boy, I'd not had sex with a guy yet, I'd never even seen a real naked penis. And in the middle of one of the, one of the scenes, my inner cookie monster reared up and said, me want do that. <laughs> and it was six years before I started stripping and eight years before movies, but eventually me got to do that. Um, well, I worked in a lingerie store from when I was 15, and I always sort of had this fascination with lingerie as being something symbolic of womanhood and femininity, and I didn't really have like a sexual um, connotation for it. Um, but I, you know, I always loved lingerie and vintage lingerie, and I kind of, when I was 18, 19, I, someone had told me I wanted to get a corset, like the ultimate lingerie piece, the most unattainable lingerie piece, and this was like 1991 or so. And someone gave me a little piece of paper with an address on it, and it was in Orange County, a place called Versatile Fashions. And I had no idea where I was going, but I walked in, and it was this fetish store. And I met this guy behind the counter that I'm still friends with, this dirty old man behind the counter, but he wasn't dirty, he was really nice. He showed me all these pictures of Betty Page, he showed me all these fetish magazines, and that's where I was like, I am going to do that, and I'm gonna do it like that, because nobody was at that time. <laughs> and so I set out to be like the next Betty Page, but it's funny, I don't really have, I didn't really, I had very strong boundaries between sex and what I was doing. So it was different for, for, for me, I think, in a lot of ways. Like, oh, yes. I like to play with it, but I always had, like, a this is my real sex life, and no one gets to see that, but they get to see the fantastical, made-up part of what I would like my sex life to be. What are those key differences in your public and private persona? Um, I mean, I feel like I'm never really, you know, I don't feel like it's real nudity because when I'm lit with the pink spotlight and I'm covered in body makeup and rhinestones and glitter and feathers and it's very like a fantasy image and it's not who I am in the bedroom, stripped, bare, you know, with bad, you know, sometimes bad lighting. Like there, You do I, not have any bad lighting in your house, let's be real. No, I don't. But <laughs> I'm just saying like it's, it, I never feel really naked. I feel like I have control over the environment and I'm giving, I'm showing what I want to show, which is not who I am scrubbed clean, you know, for my lover in, in the bedroom. It's so different for me, I think. Do you feel pressure, either of you, because of your professional career to share more of your private selves or your sexuality with your fans? I am um, non-traditionally sexual, so I am non-monogamous in my off-camera life. The reason I could do porn 35 years is two things. I really am that way. I do like groups. I do like a camera. I am exhibitionistic. I am not a monogamous person. I don't need my love and sex to be only in the same individual person. That being said, um, I made a promise to myself in the beginning, I won't do anything on camera for, uh, for pay that I don't do at home for free. So everything you see me do, I do anyway, plus stuff I reserve only for my personal life um, that no one else gets to see. That is per that is, so I do have a private personal sex life with my husband that no one gets to be a part of. And, uh, and so for me, I don't mind sharing uh, because if any story that I can tell can help an individual person fit sexuality into their lives more comfortably, then I don't mind being an example. So there's a word that I've spoken about with both of you for many years, you in particular, which is feminism. And I'd really like to know, because um, I think you both have different views on this, how you've come to define feminism in your own terms. I mean, I used to, like, when I was 20, when I'd be asked that, I'd flippantly say something like, I just want to be as feminine as possible. But now I've kind of come to realize, like, <clears throat> you know, there's, at, you know, when I first started my career, I was very much under the male gaze, you know, being a Playboy model and doing this obscure, obscure burlesque shows and headlining um, strip clubs in the, across the country before the burlesque, you know, really thing really took off. Um, and then I started, I found that with my um, vulnerability, I gained a lot of like female fans, like telling my story about why I did this and why I dye my hair black and wear all this makeup and stuff. 
Um, so I think for me, f being a feminist, like it's such a different time right now, and there does I don't think there have to be like rules about it, and there are different kinds of feminism, and we just all have to start accepting each other's um, definition of what it is to be a feminist. And I feel really lucky to be part of the burlesque community now, which is decidedly shifted to LGBTQ and female, and that's my audience, which gives me a longer career, I think. And <laughs> um, um, so I just feel really lucky that it's kind of become an unlikely feminist movement that I get to be part of instead of being just kind of like in this like, you know, being part of the, the, male, the straight male gaze. It just has more meaning for me and, that, and for other people, I think. Um, so it's, I feel, you know, just glad that it's different, that it's not what I expected, but it's what it is. Well, if Blaze Star is any uh, example, you'll have another 40 years of performance in front of you, should you want Tempest some- Tempest Storm. Or Tempest Storm, should you want something like that. So I'm a third generation feminist. My grandmother went back to school in the 30s and got her master's degree to be a teacher. My mother uh, with four kids went back to school and got her degree. And so I am my aunt was a professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz. So I come from a long line of very strong women, very empowered women, very feminist women, and very activist women. And coming up when, when I did, the idea of sexual autonomy, bodily autonomy, um, was really important. Roe v. Wade was adjudicated when I was um, 13 years old, 14 years old. So I knew it was really important that if a woman does not have autonomy over her body, she cannot be equal to men. Because the, the, while women and men can like sex equally, the consequences of sexual behavior are different for women. And the potential negative side effects are much higher for women with pregnancy and all of that. So I knew that my body is mine, my body, my rules is really, really important. Sex work, birth control, being a parent, not being a parent, um, the ability to walk down the street unmolested, <laughs> physically unmolested is really important to me. And the feminist movement has always had a dual side, um, going back certainly to the late 18th, 19th century. Victoria Woodhull, look her up, W-O-O-D-H-U-L-L. -L. She was an early advocate for feminism, for single standard feminism, free love, the right to birth control, the right to get, pick up and put down lovers as she wished. Uh, she had a seat on the stock exchange, first woman to have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. Vanderbilt was her, was her mentor, was her patron. Anyone here heard about the Comstock laws? Anthony Comstock made those laws to get a Victoria Woodhull because she was sending birth control information through the mail. She was sending contraceptive, contraceptive, contraception information through the U.S. mails, and Comstock made that illegal. Susan B. Anthony threw her under the bus and made common cause with Carrie Nation. So the, the, there's a Hitler-Stalin pact between the anti-sex feminists and the social, the social purity progressives, and it's always it's a very dark underbelly. And so sexual women like ourselves, we are not women and feminists. We are uh, tools of the devil. We are collaborators with the enemy. We are anything but um, women. And you add sex worker to that. So I'm an out sex worker. Um, Dita is an entertainer. I am an actual sex worker, and I get all the way naked on, in, in my work. And I know it's so important, bodily autonomy, and it, a woman, and a, do I have the right to my body or do I not? Period. And it's still the same argument we've been having for hundreds of years now. Female sexuality scares people. It does, and people have a lot of trouble with the idea of being a feminist and being sexually empowered. As I definitely found when I, when Dita and I first became aware of each other was in the late 90s in the burlesque scene and um, even doing that kind of work, people, I would say mainstream, had some trouble with it. How can you be this empowered, intelligent woman but also want to wear a corset? So I'm glad that we're at the Hammer Museum getting to talk about all this stuff now, like 20 well, the, years later. The whole, the whole thing, why, why is being sexual not feminist? Do I not have sex? desire? Do I not have a right to my pleasure? Do I not have a right to live my sexual life as I want? And if I like sleeping with men, does that make me a, uh, a lap dog? No, it makes me a bisexual person. So, yeah. So the, the, there's so much power. You know, the, when you claim your sexuality for you, and not for you, but for you, the power you feel from that is, in, is incredible. And, and, it's, and, it, and it causes everything else that you do. Yeah, I mean, I've always felt like I always like the idea of liberating the things that are taboo and making it fun and playful. Like, 
you know, that was why I wanted to be the next Betty Page was I could see how playful and fun and all these hardcore bondage photos. I mean, she took hard, people probably remember a lot of her pinups, but she took some pretty X-rated pictures. There's things of her hot, like tied legs spread, no underwear, you know, ball gagged. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty hardcore. And, um, you know, even the, like I've done things that were, I've made erotic films and not like you know, male, female sex films, but um, I always felt kind of glad that I did all that stuff as part of what made me who I am, and there have been moments in my life that people have always wanted to remind me of my fetish photos and all the stuff I did in the past, which I'm always proud of, you know. They're beautiful. They are beautiful. Are, have you seen them? <laughs> Let's I just like the idea of making things kind of glamorous and beautiful and playful and fun and kind of like liberating things in that way. Well, let's talk about consensual power exchange relationships or BDSM kink fetish. I would love to know from you how submission empowers you, especially in the role of a fetish model. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have always, um, I, I guess I felt, feel like in my life I have a lot of strength and I, I like the idea of reversing the roles or playing the roles and it it's never come very naturally to me to be dominant but I always liked playing the damsel in distress um, and I don't know I mean I guess it just and I've always for me engaged in um, controlled situations like I I don't even let somebody lace up my corset that is not experienced like because I've you know it's it's putting myself in positions where I feel comfortable where someone knows what they're doing and that I can trust them you know that's always been important to me and and made me feel like I'm in a safe space you know I wouldn't let just any asshole tie me up <laughs> No. Don't. You know? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> well, let's talk a little about the, the boundaries and negotiation when we're getting into fetish and kink, um, because I think both of you have different experiences of that, which I feel the heteronormative culture could really benefit from a quick primer <laughs> on how consensual power exchange relationships and sexual that, acts that's are. That's you. I low mean. and slow <laughs> over the plate. <laughs> The most important, the most important thing that heteronormative culture or regular culture or vanilla culture can learn from uh, consensual power exchange and is the notion of affirmative consent. Affirmative consent. Consent is not the absence of no; it's a statement of shared intention going forward. That's why the negotiation is very important. So. Uh, I'm what they call a top-heavy switch. I tend to be more dominant. I tend to be more bossy. But in my personal relationship, I am the consensual love slave to my husband and master. And I grew up in Berkeley. Why would a woman put on a collar and call herself a slave? Number one, with the right partner? Because it's really fun. <laughs> and it's really sexy. So consensual power exchange means you and your partner get to create each time a special protected bubble of intimacy that just you and your partner get to figure out what do you want to do? What are we doing today? Damsel in distress? Fireman? Print, what? What are we doing? You get to figure that out and no one else has to like it or know about it. It's very empowering. It's very romantic because you must keep continually... What I like about BDSM is you cannot just ever go back to neutral or just the way things used to be. You must continually communicate throughout the session, what's going on, and that's very romantic. You must keep turning to each other what, what you're doing. You can't just check out. You check out, someone's going to lose an eye. And then, the, and then the fun is gone, and then... <laughs> it's a new game, find the eyeball. But that's... The, that, it, just, it, just, it just wrecks the whole mood. So, I, uh, so consensual power exchange is based on consent. And so affirmative consent. The question people always ask me, probably to you too, Dita, how do I get my partner, dot, dot, dot. That was actually the and number one question we got. And you never get anyone to do anything. This is a consensual BDSM above board. I would love to tie you up and experiment with floggers. And you can say, yes, and the floggers, no, and the tying up, and I can go deal. So you have to speak your desires. But what I love about BDSM, what Dita and I and Liz do, we speak our desires and manifest them in our lives because we believe we have the right to do that. 
And we, get, we believe we have the right to live our sexual lives for the benefit of ourselves and our partners, and nobody else gets a say. And you all have that right, too. <laughs> so you, you feel a real responsibility, going back to your degree as a nurse, to ha be a positive in sex positive influence not just on your fans, but on society at large. Oh, yes. If I hadn't done porn, I would have been, an, if I hadn't been exhibitionistic enough or pretty enough for porn, I would have been a nurse midwife. And both uh, birthing babies and birthing orgasms are very similar. They're body-based They're body -based activities that your body can naturally do if they have the correct support. And um, for a lot of people, have, achieving pleasure is as difficult as giving birth because of the way the culture treats bodies and, and trains minds. And so for me... Um, uh, I made porn because in our culture, sexuality is sick, and sick people need nursing care. So do you think we're not using our bodies to our full potentials to both receive and give pleasure? Hardly. <laughs> like what percentage? <sighs> Man, I think 20% I think of people have really happy sex lives. Like, if you, 20% of the population has a sex life that supports them. It is a natural extension of their values. It supports their partnership, and, their, and they feel good about it. And the rest of the people are just some kind of struggling with it, all the way to hate it all the time. So there's 20% hate it all the time. It's never good for them. 20%, they figured it out. It's always going to be good. And the 60% in the middle, it's like, I never have bad sex anymore. I never had, in the beginning, I used Come on, when we started having sex, oh, you had a good start. I had, <laughs> we, I didn't, okay, my, yeah, it took me years to learn to like sex, but I never have bad sex anymore because I make sexuality practice important in my life. And yeah, I feel like I even know how to make it good. Even when, when I was single for a while, I was like, oh, Lord, like being single in L.A. was like the worst. And also being a little bit of a size queen, I was sort of like disappointed a lot. And, and I but I was still like, I can make this good. Watch this. You know, I mean, so I just wouldn't like be scared of what the guy would think or whatever. I would just be like, here's what I'm going to do. I don't know what you're going to do. And, but, but, what, but when women step up and say what it is we desire, men get what they want, which is a woman interested in sex with him. I tell people, men, you can have happy pussy twice a week or unhappy pussy seven days a week, your choice. Yeah, when you say what you want, it's like you are doing what you, if you, uh, if you don't, say what you want you're kind of failing him because also they like to be told what to do and they like to know that they're against somebody that's a challenge and if and men men want to be good at it's one thing you know porn is not sex ed but the trope in porn however stupid it is that women desire sex want it and they want it with you and so most men i run across they want to be good in bed they may not know anything about how that actually works in real life because porn's not real life um say it again say it again Porn is not real life. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> but the most, most people would like to be good in bed. And men would like to be pleasing. So if we don't tell them what we want, they can't be pleasing, so we're angry. And we have to learn how to say it nicely, and you have to learn how to hear it without getting butthurt over it. Have you ever had an experience on a film set where it was just not working out? Yes, and he just goes, on, I can get through anything in 90, 90 minutes. I can, I can work with it. And he just goes on my no list after that. Just never again. Don't know why, but it's never, no. Nah. So, Dita. <laughs> <laughs> the late, great burlesque queen Zarita, who I think we both are, were fans of, she once told me that my boobs, or boobs in general, were as important in a business meeting in negotiations as my brains were. Um, so I wanna know for you as an entrepreneur, you have such a femme fatale persona that precedes you when you go into a meeting, in one of these Hollywood meetings, where you're probably the only woman in, a room, in the room. Do you feel a need to downplay your sexuality in the business sphere, or do you think having that sensuality puts people off guard and kind of aids you in negotiating? Yeah, I feel like it's not even not just sexuality, but kind of everything. Like I use everything that I've got in, you know, in the real world. Like I think I discovered early on, you know, I'm I'm a dishwater blonde from a farming town in Michigan. Like I I discovered this like 
red lipstick and these outfits, you know, can get me far and I can get more of what I want and they get, it gives me confidence. And it's so it's not just sexuality, but it's like the overall like mystique when I decided I was going to be femme fatale and I was going to be, you know, find my power with the way that I dress and how I notice like makeup and hair and clothes make me feel. But it's also, you know, sensuality as well. And I, I use it with every, you know, I use everything from the way I walk in a room the way I walk past someone, the way I take touch a glass or whatever. I mean, I feel like I, I just try to use, like, you know, my it's confidence mostly. But what makes it work is that you and I are not lying. We also have good sex lives at home, so we're not fronting yeah. a fake thing. Yeah. We're going home to an empty an empty house with 10 cats. Yeah. We're like going home right. to lovers. We're going, we're going home to partners who want us there yeah. and who are happy to see but, us, so, we, so it is not a compensation. Yeah. It is an expression of our... Of our actual self yeah. and I don't use sexuality like I don't flirt I mostly use like the dominatrix persona like playing with that with people and you know just that that, that feel not like oh, please like me please you know I don't use my sexuality in that way I'll use it more in like a you know like oh <laughs> she claims to be a damsel in distress well. but she's actually built the railroad tracks tied herself to them right. organized <laughs> the lighting <laughs> And has the train on cue. Yes, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so, you know, your profile grew really quickly in, in the fashion world and in Hollywood, and they really, people knew you from doing these private, private parties for big fashion brands. Did you feel disruptive at all in that space once, because you had this whole background in fetish, as a fetish yeah. model, which I don't think as many people were familiar with. Yeah, I think it was really sort of like a few people that kind of put their stamp of approval on me, like Jean-Paul Gaultier and Marc Jacobs, people that weren't afraid of like, this is what I think is cool right now. Like I found myself, you know, stripping at the Louis Vuitton party in Paris. And that was all like, kind. Of, yeah, it was disruptive, you know, but I had those people kind of championing for me, you know. Um, and there have been moments like I was, a global brand ambassador for a huge French brand and suddenly like there was this needle on the record and all the press was like you know she made these erotic films and bondage stuff and the brand was called Quantro and their tagline was be controversial and they basically like everyone's like she's gonna lose her deal and everyone was kind of scared and then suddenly like Quantro went be controversial. We love it. <laughs> awesome. We're French. That's awesome. They used it Come as here. marketing. So, uh, yeah, awesome. I got embraced in Europe kind of quickly. On but you're also an artist. Here. You're clearly an artist, and they really appreciate life as art. And because you, you, you know, I, I, go, I will go out in no makeup, and you are always, you're always where you need to be, and so you never disappoint. Um, and... So, of course, they're going to love you in Europe. Of course, you can be a global brand ambassador because... But it is, you know, I did. I do have other people on the other side saying, you don't deserve to be there because you are not pure and you did this and you did that. And I was like, mm -hmm, it's part of what makes me fun to watch. Okay. You learned it all at church camp. That's right. <laughs> And I think there is a thing that's like people, you know, I always, I remember when that happened and I was sort of like, well, how is it different that I made a beautiful, epic Andrew Blake film shot in Paris, like with diamonds and all these beautiful clothes and stepping out of 40s cars. And then like a Kardashian can make a sex tape or Paris Hilton can make a sex tape and then say, I'm sorry. But because I didn't say sorry, it's a problem. I basically did it and controlled it and said, look at this, you know, instead of saying, oh, God, they found my sex tape. I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. You know, that's, I think, one of the big issues in America. I think, I think that, like, that's why that makes you such a, a fierce fan object for young women because you are clearly in charge of your own narrative and your own presentation, and that means they can be too. Very supportive women up here. So, Nina, I've got a question for you. Um, the language around sex is changing so quickly. Sometimes I think people have a hard time keeping up with what's appropriate to say. How can we speak ethically about the modern state of erotic labor when it comes to adult performers' sex work? Thank you for that. Um, the, so going back to the 80s sex wars, um, there's always... <laughs> So there's always been a split. Uh, so the 80s was the big split between the pro and anti-censorship um, feminists. Uh, this is the era, the era of the Mies Commission and sex moving from, uh, pornography moving from 
theaters into the home. Uh, went from you know the back alley to Main Street and our living rooms. And the well, I was trying to talk, and the friends and I who were doing it then, uh, and all the younger sex workers weren't even born yet. They're still in diapers, so they weren't part of the struggle. But the idea of Labor is labor, so sex work is a labor issue, and due to Puritanism and our background around sexuality, somehow the labor of my vulva is way more freighted or different or scary or dangerous or bad than the labor of any other part of my body. Lifting that bar, toting that bale, typing those letters, doing the math, taking care of kids, labor is labor. Am I compensated fairly for it or not? Do I have agency over my working conditions or do I not? Do I have the right to use my vulva for labor or do I not? I think I do in consent and other people don't. So now the, the, you know, the antis call us prostituted women. We prefer, we prefer the term consensual sex worker because they're the, they're, it can be consensual sex work. And the certain brand of thinking thinks that no sex work can be consensual because no woman would ever want to do that. It's very sex negative, very erotophobic. And so speaking of the sex worker, the energy coming at me from radical feminists who say that all penetration is rape, or the energy coming at me from the religious folk who say that I'm a sinner is the same energy coming at me. The, the words are different. This uses this language so they can feel hateful and prejudicial. And this group uses that language so they can, but so they can, they still permit themselves to feel hatred and prejudicial and never think they have to question it because of course they're right, of course sex is icky, of course men are horrible, of course women are pure creatures. I would never want to do this. I must have daddy issues. And, daddy and no, I'm hashtag. queer, I'm queer. My mother used to say, and she was, she took her 26 years to go to K with what I did, luckily. Zen cushions last forever and she finally got there. But she thought I did porn because she and my dad were not there for me growing up and saying, Ma, I'm queer. And sex is my thing. I have to be in the sex thing. In our culture, if it's a sex thing, then it's porn because Hollywood looks away at the last minute. And I'm a nurse. It's the part of the body. So for me, showing you my vulva is the same as showing you my elbow because there are three billion vulvas in the world. Did you know that? And there are three billion penises. So vulvas and penises are amazing, beautiful, fantastic, but they're not rare. They're everywhere. This room is full of them. <laughs> and I could tell you what, I could, and so, so my sex practices, I know, and it, everything being equal for time, hygiene, testing, and all the things, I could have an amazing time with each one of you. And each one of you would walk away feeling that was the most amazing thing ever, and it would be the most amazing thing ever, because you never had sex with someone like me, because... <laughs> I've been having sex professionally for 35 years, and I'm really good at it. But that being said, any, any person can get good at sex for themselves, and any two people can develop entirely perfect, wonderful, loving sex relationship between them that is satisfying and pleasing and wonderful. We are wired for pleasure out of the box. And the only reason we don't have access to our bodily pleasure is culture and conditioning. But since we carry our bodies everywhere with us, you can always start turning back to yourself. You can always come back to yourself through a good masturbation practice. So what do you think about the FOSTA and SESTA bills, which were introduced by the current sitting president of the United States in April 2018, which are ostensibly created to fight online sex trafficking and to stop internet sex trafficking. But in fact, these bills are not what they seem. No, they're not. So you just go online and look for SESTA slash FOSTA, S-E-S-T-A, and F-O-S-T-A. Both of these House and Senate are to stop sex trafficking. But um, they're not going to do that because most uh, sex traffickers don't pay attention to the law anyway. But what it does do, what the laws do, they're punitive because sex workers were using the internet as a way to safely screen, put more distance between themselves and clients. Well, they can screen the client, they can uh, have um, boards where women uh, workers can talk amongst themselves about safe clients or unsafe clients, they can get off the street. So for street level workers, the internet was a lifesaver. It saved lives. And, um, but again, because we need protecting, oh, we need protecting because no little girl wants to grow up to be a sex worker. Um, and the rad femmes and the anti-sex, uh, anti 
decriminalization of sex work people are very persuasive because the SESTA FOSTA bills feed into our cultural narrative of sex is dangerous, women are victims, men are horrible, and men are horrible. And to mention that men are really horrible. Um, so it, no. uh, but what, so what, <laughs> but what is happening, so for, it's a disaster. People have already uh, been, who had finally gotten off the streets are going back on the streets. People who've gotten away from pimps now say pimps are coming back into their lives saying, I'll get your clients, I'll get your clients. So, so it is a big disaster. On June 2nd, there's a citywide and I think nationwide um, mark for sex workers' rights. So you can uh, look online for that. So SESTA and FOSTA are misguided. They are a lie. They're already, it's already causing harm. And again, again, they're not listening to us. Kamala Harris is not listening to the sex workers who said, Miss Harris, please, please listen to us. We are telling you about, so for feminists, some of our stories are true and real. Your voice is important. We want to hear your story, except you guys who say that sex work does not hurt me. I like doing sex work because men are horrible. And so the, the whole notion, and I don't think men are horrible. I think most people in our culture are wounded around sexuality and female wounding around sexuality looks one way and, and female wounding around sexuality looks another way. And then we're supposed to meet in the middle and find partners. <laughs> so if you, if you were the sex ed teacher at a high school in Los Angeles and you could design your own curriculum, and change all of this, what would, be, what would be the first lesson? The prime directive is do not use sex to harm self or others. And that means you need to be celibate for a while. Be celibate for a while. It's okay. Your body's not going to go anywhere. If you're using sex to harm self or others, please take a look at that and step back from that. Um, uh, period one. Then, of course, comprehensive, age-appropriate, fact-based, sexual information. But what happens with sex education, you can get sick, you can get pregnant, it hurts, but never why do we have sex? Because it's pleasurable, because it's intimate, because, we can, because it brings us closer. And so what I would tell people is bring, bring back to 50s without the shame. So of all the things in the 52 cards of things you can do with sex, the two most dangerous things are penis in a vagina and penis in an anus. So take those two cards out, 50 cards of fun things you can do about sex. So what can we do together that does not risk death or babies? There is so much to do. <laughs> what, would be, what would your first lesson be as the sex ed teacher? Well, I would uh, bring her book and I would just teach from the book and just throw in some, you know, of my I would bring Ms. Fontese in to teach about presentation and confidence. Because how long, how long, I was dancing a year before I understood, wait, the audience can't read my mind. But they can. They can read your thoughts. <laughs> Only if I'm acting them out. Yeah, I don't know. I always just thought like, oh, you can, if whatever you're thinking comes across to people. I mean, for the most part. But you don't have to be thinking what you want them to think. But like, you know. For me, it, learning, to, discovering that smiling I could be freaking out going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, my G-string is, G is slipping. Oh heck, oh heck, oh heck. But if you're doing this, they're looking, oh, happy girl. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's when they yeah. can't read your mind. So if you're freaking out, you just. Um, yeah, I mean, I always, people ask me a lot about confidence, of course. And I, I mean, I just kind of say it's like the weather, you know, like sometimes I do not feel any confidence, like bad lighting dressing room, trying on clothes, I get like, ah, oh, trauma. And I think, oh, I should quit immediately. Um, and then I go into like pink lighting and, you know, and then I feel good again. So I always say like the confidence factor, it's like something one minute you feel really confident and the next minute you don't and you try to control what those things are that make you feel good, like being around people that uplift you and, you know, not being coerced into things that don't make you feel comfortable, that, you know, make you feel uncomfortable and just trying to control the environment and noticing what makes you feel confident and what doesn't, whether it's people, things, what you wear, or what you, how your hair is, whatever, you know. I always go back to appearance because I just think, like, I can have a way better, more confident day if I take a minute for myself. Dye your hair. Yes. No, but, but, it, but, it, but, it, but, but that's absolutely true. Um, when you look good, you feel good. When you feel good, you are different in the world. And and just being like, oh, I don't feel I don't feel confident. I will later though. <laughs> yeah. 
a little later. You know, I mean, surely like people always are asking me that. And like, I just like, I don't, I'm not the epitome of confidence. I mean, I do what I can, but every once in a while I'm like, whoa, I do not want to know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm talking about. Like right now, I don't know what I'm talking about. You're doing about. great. You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> so, Nina, what do you think of the responsibility of porn performers when it comes to sex ed versus parents? Because you really are the first line of sexual education for so many young people, <laughs> especially with the internet. Porn is a paid professional performance of a fantasy scenario. The who, the what, the where, the why, the when is somebody else's idea. Would I, of my own free will, show up on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock in a barn to have sex on a hay bale with George <laughs> without being paid? No, no, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> but if the fantasy of having sex in a barn turns you on, I'm happy to play that performance. So sex, unless you're getting my sex ed tapes or Tristan Terramino's sex ed tapes or Jessica Drake. Drake's sex ed tapes, porn is not sex ed. But by the time a person sees porn, even if they're quite young, the family, the family uh, unit is really important. How you feel about sex depends on parental example, affectionate touch. Was your body yours or were you harmed, uh, were you harmed physically by someone bigger and older than you? And not even sexual abuse, just the way we raise children robs them of their bodies, robs them of their pleasure. Up to three kids are so happy to be running around naked. They're so happy. By the time they're five or six, they're learning, oh, can't do that, mustn't do that. And adults shame, adults, pre we, pass our shame on to children unconsciously, and then we wonder, why do they get in trouble? So by the time they, so someone finds porn, um, they should already know the proper names for the body parts and where they're located, and what do our families think, what do our families think about sex, and where does, where does intimacy belong in our belief system? And you're gonna do what you're gonna do, but we would prefer if you did it this way. So having a, it's an ongoing conversation, it's not a talk about the birds and bees, it's how do you touch the child? We start in infancy, we touch boy babies less, we comfort them less, we rob them of their emotional language and emotional, um, uh, expression and uh, range of emotions. And then one, so we get, they get to be mad and they get to be happy. And so we have no word frustrate, frustrated, lonely, scared, um, um, worried. And so we wonder Vulnerable. What, we, and we'll wonder why they act out the way that they do. We only get the one way to act out. And we have we give them no language. And be a man, suck it up, stiff upper lip. Yeah, pussy, you a sissy. So still, we still shame boys by calling them girls. Somehow it's bad to be a girl. And yet, this, ah, ah. <laughs> so, so many people speak about this as a very common understanding. And uh, so comprehensive sex education starts at home with mainly how we handle the bodies of helpless infants and children. Do we handle them roughly, kindly, caringly, frightened? That all comes in to their nervous system and affects their brain. So, I mean, now with the proliferation of pornography on the internet, it's interesting because both of you are real digital entrepreneurs. I mean, you had one of the first websites when you were first starting your career, right, in the 90s? Yeah, I mean, I for sure had the first vintage pin-up site, and I remember, and I'm sure you remember this too, like Danny's Hard Drive. Like, I had one of the first adult, like, membership websites. Um, and, yeah, and it's definitely evolved... And um, yeah, oh, so from I when mean, you first started doing an adult site to, to uh, now, I you know I mean I can't speak for like the um, glamour model porn star like the membership thing websites I think that's evolved a lot. Shrunk, sure, yeah. <laughs> Less yeah. money to be made because everything's free. Yeah, but you um oh god I just was gonna compliment you on something you, you were the first one to do, <laughs> and I lost it. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, you invented, the fetish model had completely died before you came back. You, you recreated the, the job niche of fetish model, and, and you showed that it could be done. It was an, and no one works harder than Dita, just so you know. Sure, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but you started in 1819 and you created mm. this 
thing yourself. You would take all your own stuff to the conventions and just you were your you worked alone for a long time and you just did it day in day out. And people think you you took twenty years to be an overnight success, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I think people need to hopefully appreciate the level of work that goes into to doing what you do and maintaining it at the level you have for as long as you have. Thank you. Because you were doing member subscri uh, subscriber services on your website yeah, back in I had in like the a membership site, and it's still there. It's more of an archive now because I just couldn't really keep up with the shooting content. I didn't want to shoot content. And when I look at it now, I'm like, wow, there's 55,000 photos on there, and what? none of them are retouched. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, I can't, I don't want to do that now. I don't want to, like, just take, because I used to just, like, to take, like, you know, 100 pictures and just put them on there, and it was really, like, different being um, not in the public eye in that way. And um, But now I'm sort of, like, always hyper aware of the images that that are out there because it's open, all the floodgates are open and you're, you know, people love to scrutinize to make themselves feel better. Whereas I don't feel like that was, that wasn't really the case before. It was sort of, it was different. Before Instagram, before everyone has to be, you know, uh, filter ready all the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. We didn't have filters, we had film. <laughs> Back in the day. <laughs> so both of you are the subject of countless erotic fantasies, including probably the subject of a lot of people here in this audience. We're gonna go home tonight and think about you both. Um, is there ever any psychological toll to that, to, to knowing that? I don't really feel like that that much, but I mean, my audience, when I, in my shows, I mean, it's like 85% women and the rest are either boyfriends, husbands of the women that are there and LGBTQ community. I don't often feel that anymore. Although the last show I did in Indianapolis, there were a bunch of guys that came from the racing thing and they had their big tall boys up. Oh and I was goodness. like, whoa, that's so crazy. There's like actual, like there's dudes in the audience <laughs> that are like, boobs, you know? And I'm just like, I'm, I'm so not used to that anymore because it's been so long, but I loved it in a way. Um, but I'm just so used to it being like the girls that are there that I mean I don't know if they're having sexual fantasies I don't know they're, but mostly I hear like oh, half like them want to be like you and other half want to do you right I guess I just feel a little removed from it because I'm used to seeing like and meeting people and seeing the you know hearing their stories about you know finding their confidence with burlesque and pinup and all that stuff but, so that, but, that, but by finding their confidence with burlesque and pinup that will also empower them in the bedroom so you don't have to have been right. completely naked mm -hmm. doing what I do mm -hmm. I'm glad you didn't do what I because because you you're you're able to go over there and do your job um, and it, that I could never do you know I, I I stripped but I was never burlesque it's like nah man I can be naked rock on <laughs> <laughs> I never felt that comfortable really being naked for real you know definitely not letting people see my sexuality but it's a real I always kind of wished I could be more free like that you know Yes. Bidet right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about you? How do you feel when you have a much I more direct love relationship yeah. with your fans? I would be with every. I, I'm queer enough. I'm queer. I'm queer enough that again, everything being equal for hygiene, hygiene, health, and manners, and grooming. I'm interested. I'm genuinely interested in sharing sexual space with every anybody once, because I can. I can have fun with anybody once because ooh, novelty. Hello, um, and challenge. It's not a challenge, it's just an interest of mine. It's like orchids, you know. Um, <laughs> the more uh, exotic, the better. Just every time someone lets me touch their naked body, it's like, really? For me? I'm never, I, I treat every, this is a little bit woo, but um, I, don't, I don't have a, a God-based faith system. But if I, but pleasure, consensual pleasure, mutually engaged in, allows the sacred to emerge. Ritual is not sacred, but it allows the sacred to emerge. When we both put our energies into the same thing, I'm going to show up and be kind to you and listen to what you want. You're going to show up and be kind to me and listen to what I want. And we're going to work this out together with consensual pleasure at the top of it and getting my ego out of the way of what you need to get off. You're, oh, 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 my biggest mis... Next to how can I get my partner is so and so didn't give me an orgasm. My partner, my can't, I can't give my partner an orgasm. Not your job. <laughs> my job as a sex partner is to make you feel safe enough and seen enough and sexy enough that you can find your own orgasm. I can't give, it, I can't give you an orgasm. It's your body. Ah, I can help. Hold your hat. Hold your coat. Hold your hair. Hold the lube. I mean, I'll, 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 I will, I will assist the fuck out of your orgasm. <laughs> 
but you're going to be having it. And the side coda is people say, oh, baby, two things. And men, this is bad porno talk. Two things. Oh, baby, come for me. And I say, oh, my God, that was great. I've had enough. Oh, yeah, you have one more in you. No, no, I don't. If I had one more in me, you would know, and I would tell you. Don't tell me my... Bo- what? So, yeah. so, guys, if a partner says, I've had enough, listen to that. And if she says, a little more to the left, do that. <laughs> Help a lady out. Or hold the vibrator. I mean, let, hold, let her hold the vibrator, and you play with her boobs. I mean, whatever. Y'all really need to buy Nina's book. <laughs> Such a good book. Because if you like the way she's speaking here, that book is so well written. She will tell you what to bring to a party. If you're going to a swinging party, she'll tell you to pack a duffel bag and bring a change of clothes and some snacks. Like a, a checklist, yeah? And Uggs. <laughs> For after. So before, before we take some questions from the audience, um, I wanted to ask you, being that we're at the Hammer Museum, what do you feel are the differences or connection between art and porn? Well, um, since porn deals directly with... Porn is a vulgar medium, right? It's designed to be like popcorn, you know, and occasionally you'll find a scene that you love so much you can keep that movie because that particular scene... <gasps> Love it every time. Or, uh, but most movies are, are just, that's why they're just so cheaply made. They'll make $10,000 $10, movies instead of one really nice $100,000 movie still to this day. But art deals with the big subjects, war, death, love, birth, and why shouldn't it deal with sex? Sex is how we all got here. Sex is a, con- a, a universal human concern. And the fact that it is, it is relegated to a business that was only recently run by you know, crooks and outsiders shows how much we don't value sex. We claim to value it very highly, but we treat it like garbage. And we treat the people who, who front it or work in that field like garbage. But it, porn is where we hold, hold our sexual dreams. Porn is really important in that way. Um, if you can think it, there's probably a porn about it. Uh, and, and, but understand, it's a movie. Your partner may not like that, so ask first. Just because I, I'm acting like I like it on camera doesn't mean your partner's going to like that very same thing. Just, just ask. Would you consider like the Andrew Blake film you did or Rocco Sofredi, who's another porn, pornographer, director, more art porn films? I mean, I suppose so, but it's all up to the watcher. I don't really, you know, like to say that's art, that's porn, that's entertainment. You know, it's really all up for interpretation, you know. Um, So I'd love to open it up to some questions. I see some hands raised. I don't know if there's people in the the aisles with um, people in the audience aisles with microphones. And I see, okay. Hi. Hi. So I have a question for Elise. Why do you think that's so hard for people to assume what they like, their real sexuality? Because I'm bisexual, and when I tell my girlfriends that I'm bisexual, that I also enjoy women, they're like, oh, oh my gosh. (laughs) They get so surprised, and for me, it's just so natural, So especially today, like, Come on, people. It, it's evolved. You can show up almost naked on Instagram. It's okay. Why is not okay? You express yourself. I so. think we're all struggling to figure it out, right? There's, um, we're on a constant evolution our, uh, as a sexual being, and you know what you like or you're exposed to at like 13 or 15 is going to be different than when you're 25 or 45 or 60 or 80, and 90 and still having, you know, great sex. So, I mean, that's why I think we're all up here talking about it right now is to, so you can have more comfortable conversations with, with your friends, with the people you love, with the people you're having sex with. I Just feel a pervert. <laughs> <laughs> but consensual pervery is fine. It's about, the, it's about consent. So, I, so the friends I know who are, who are either monogamous or, um, or heterosexual, I don't, I don't, I don't have sex with them. I had one friend who was heterosexual, 
um, Candida Royale, a filmmaker, and our sex life consisted of me flirting with her and her letting me dance with her. And that was it. She you used, flirted with me and danced with me before they I all know. came in. I know, because you said it was Did okay. you do this to all the girls? I thought I was special. You are special. <laughs> but, 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 every, but every woman's special because every woman's different because as a polyamorous person, every person's vibration is different. So if there's another tall redhead with my eyes closed, she'd feel like her and you'd feel like you. And I don't get confused. If you're a man, I, I don't get confused. I don't get confused. I don't, I'm not going to think that she's... No, I'm not going to call it the wrong name in the middle. <laughs> uh, there's another question. I see a hand back there, up at the top. Please wait for the mic. Oh, wait. No, no, for next. Okay. I recently realized that I was bisexual as well. And, but I've been in a relationship for about a year and a half. And I also was talking to my therapist and she recommended that I read The Ethical Slut. And um, I started reading it and I was like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. But my girlfriend, who I love so much, and she's been like a really, really important part of my life, I kind of brought it up as something where it's like, hey, this is something I think I might be interested in, but I, you know, like, if you're not okay with it, that's totally fine. It's just something that I might be interested in. And she took that as, like, I want to have sex with other people actively. And that it kind of took her down and destroyed her a little bit. And it was really saddening for me because it was like, no, 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 no. That's not at all what I'm trying to say. I love you so much. I just, like, what if I feel love differently? And how can we have that conversation without me hurting you and hurting our relationship in a way that was totally unintended? And I'm just oh, really that conversation. That. Yeah, how do you do that in a marriage? So yeah. it, it's very hard to, it, in our culture, um, it's very hard to find people who do not take it personally our desires. Desires are not actions. You can desire and think and want anything you want. You can't do anything you want. But you can want anything you want. Some of my fantasies are illegal, immoral, and against the laws of physics. <laughs> But I don't try to make those real. In real life with another human, I have to take into account their limits and boundaries and desires as well. So I would tell to your girlfriend, if you, you weren't saying you were going to do it, you weren't saying you had to do it, but you're, you felt safe enough to express your true desire, and she got all personally hurt over it instead of being able to think, whoa, okay, um, this is really new, and I don't have that desire. It's a start of a conversation. You're not going to go out behind her back and start banging people, but it's a conversation that you need to have. And for you to live the next 50 years fully yourself, at some point you will probably really want to experiment with that in real life. And she can either grow with you toward that moment being okay for her, or you will never get to do it, or the relationship may have to take a different form. Um, and a great book after Ethical Slut is More Than Two, T-W-O, um, and it's the best book on consensual non-monogamy that I've seen after ethical slut. And also these conversations are, they're gonna be messy, right? They're not always gonna go the way that we picture it in, in our heads, but the fact that you were brave enough to bring it up, I think is And also beautiful. kind enough and not even to, be to share with her. us here, so thank you. You, know, you. you didn't cheat, you spoke, you brought up, so she should hopefully see that as a good thing that you did. You're, you, she didn't find out that you were you know, cheating, that you trust and love her enough to, to be honest with her, and hopefully she will see that as a positive. I see a lot more hands. Okay. I don't. There's the hat here. Hello. Okay. The mic's not on. Oh, hey, the mic is on. Hey, my name is Reggie McKinley, and I am very, very deeply intrigued by diversity and inclusion. And so, Dita, I actually forwarded a cousin and turned a cousin on to you and what you do, and being a brown woman in burlesque and movement. Uh, she's found it kind of hard to transition and to move. And so I want to ask you specifically, where do you see diversity and inclusion showing up in your industry? And in actionable steps, how do you have it extend to include more individuals? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm always casting um, unique people, whether it's their body shape, their age, their... Um, ethnicity like this is important to me in my show you know I I I aim for people to leave my show um, 
feeling inspired by someone they saw, like they can find some kind of like commonality with something they saw and people that can change people's minds about what it is to be a burlesque dancer because it is very different in 2018 than it was in its so-called golden age. I think I kind of beg to differ that it's kind of seeing a major moment right now. And I think, you know, in the burlesque community, it's super diverse. I mean, if you, if, if you really get into it right now, there are so many different genres of burlesque and people that are really, um, the best performers are not anymore like these, you know, 20 something little pinup girls that it's, it's not the case anymore. Like I'm constantly scanning the globe and I bring people in my show, um, from all over the world, from Australia to Puerto Rico, Poland. <laughs> I mean, I have people from all over the world and that's, always been really important to me because I want people to leave, you know, feeling inspired that they saw something different. And I think, you know, burlesque really is inclusive right now. Um, so I'm sure, you know, there's really a place for, for everyone of, you know, of, of every type. I mean, boys, girls, you know, the gender fluidity. It's like, it's, it's really a great time in burlesque right now. I think, um, you know, if you, if you get into it, you'll, you'll find that too. Yes. Hi, ladies. I had a question about how can you heal your love life after you've dealt with grief, say losing a loved one or even with the Me Too movement. Um, yeah, I know it's it's no no no. It's a very different point. So first, um, grief uh, feelings are felt in the body. So I would, besides any talk therapy, I would look into any kind of body based therapy, massage, Reiki, movement. Um, yoga, just any way that lets you find a peaceful way into your body so you can be with your grief, so you can actually feel it and not block it out and not have to uh, numb it, but actually feel it. Feelings go in, a, in, a, in a, a bell curve, and most of us check out. So from no feeling to the most intense feeling back to no feeling. Most people start checking out before it get, hits its peak in discomfort because it doesn't feel good. So that's when we do what we do to check out. And when we finally are going to process our grief fully, we're going to feel it and we're going to just shh. And it, but every feeling has is a waveform or we would feel the stubbed toe from two years ago. Every feeling will pass if we let it in and let it, let us feel it. Now, you need help letting feelings in. That's why you get supportive help and therapeutic help that deals with somatic-based or body-based therapy forms that help you stay there while you process. Because we do, we do keep trauma and grief in our bodies and animals in the wild, when they're attacked or when they get hurt, you know, they shake and they shake until they, they shake it off. But what we do as humans is we go And so any kind of traumatic sexual experience especially is stored in your body's cells and this isn't some esoteric woo -woo no, this is science situation. This is, this is science-based. Um, so I think you, you can't put too much pressure on your head or on therapy to like, oh, I should be done with this. I've, no, I've talked to this to death because sometimes it really is on a you know, a visceral level, and your body just needs to needs time to process it. And there's a really good uh, book out uh, about uh, uh, becoming sexually comfortable after sexual trauma. It's, it's a growing library of that information out there. So you feel your grief. Allow yourself to be to grieve and allow yourself to feel your feelings for as long. There's no timeline. You know, you, sh you should be over it by now. No, you're over it when you're over it. You're over it when you fully process it and accept it as part of your new identity because it's, the experience cannot be unhad. So how do I incorporate this into my life going forward in a way that doesn't crush me? And that is an individual journey. This poor guy down here has been trying to... Thank you. Okay. So, um, Deed, I dressed for you this evening. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Okay, so, yeah. Boy, am I glad I didn't miss this. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, uh, my name's Jack Enyard. I'm a cartoonist, and my, my aunt was a burlesque queen. Uh, Ada Leonard, do you know who she is? Was she performing here in Los Angeles? No, in Chicago. And, well, around uh, what time? Well, I'll show you. She, oh, looks, okay. <laughs> she looks so much like Dita, it spooks me. And Dita, I met you when um, I, uh, I bought your book, and I gave you a an archive our, of our her stuff because I thought, what am I going to do with this? So, 
And Liz? Oh. oh, we all have envelopes. What we frustrated, what Thank frustrated you very much. me was for your, for your movie, Pretty Things, you just missed her because she died just like a couple years before you interviewed all these people. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm, so I'm you'll sorry. see. Okay. Thank you so much. You well, thank yes. you for. This is a shameless excuse to get in contact with all of you. Oh, well. Good then. You succeeded. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Fantastic. Thank um, you. Okay, there's so many people raising their hands, but I don't... How about right here? Okay, right here. We can hear you. Do you think that America as a total culture, do you think we're doing this better now or worse? You mean since October 2017? No, I mean... (laughs) 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 Not just. I'm old enough to have seen a little bit of the sweep and two steps forward one step back so we have empowered sex workers who are organizing on june 2 for um you know let her survive and then we have sesta fosta we have um a president now who is seeking to institute the gag rule for health care providers here in america uh, making it harder to obtain a legal procedure that one in three women we're gonna ha- are gonna have in their lifetime. So that is w- going way backwards. On the other hand, we have greater discussion about diversity and um, Me Too and mosque me, uh, mosque me Too and Church Me Too and all, so the discussion's happening, but the deep, deep trends of erotophobia and sex negativity in v- imbue our social structure, our law structure, our our ethos, our so-called morality, and the idea that I'm an immoral person because of how I use my body to make a living and not how do I treat the poor, how do I treat my parents. It is the fact that that what's considered moral versus immoral behavior, I can pollute all I want as long as I don't have any sex with anybody else but my husband. I can be a major polluter. I can totally fuck over workers, but I don't cheat on my wife. Um, So I just think morality needs to to shift what's considered moral or immoral behavior. If it's consensual, if consensual sexuality is moral and non-consensual sexuality is a crime. I do think, though, that we have made some inroads because, um, you know, just we're here. We're here. <laughs> I, we're here. I've been writing about this subject and speaking at institutions like this, and it's really, I mean, this is, I'm so just honored and excited that the hammer is having us here tonight to talk about this because 100% this would not have happened pre October, 2017. I can tell you that. So if that whole, if the situation of me too times up has made us talk about sex more in the media, some of it, I don't agree with it. Some of it I do, at least we're talking about it. So there's the upside. See ya. Boy, awesome. This has been phenomenal. I'm going to switch positions here a little bit. Oh. And <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Okay, so I heard that there are anywhere between 9 and 12 different types of female orgasms. What I would like to know is what are each of your favorites? <laughs> and say a little bit more. Well, my favorite involves my Hitachi and my butt. We'll leave it at that. But not, you know, no. Hitachi in the front and my husband working his magic elsewhere. (laughs) I'm currently, I think, the most personally fascinated with the intersection of spirituality and sexuality. And so I would say that one of the most exciting ways to orgasm that I've learned in the last five years has been connected to my meditation and breathing practice. Um, And I meditate a lot here at the Hammer. They have a public program that's free on Thursdays um, at 1230. But um, I learned a technique where you can have an orgasm just by breathing and using your kegels, not touching yourself, not touching anybody else. And that has been a real game changer that I wish I had learned a long time ago. Do you know Barbara Corellis? Yeah. Yeah. Barbara Corellis, um, urbantantra.org. She can breathe herself into an orgasm in five minutes. She did it in a functional MRI machine and saw her brain light up later. (laughs) 
and, it's amazing. And, and so here it's I am. I, I'm the sex professional. I do sex for a living. I went to her workshop and I tried, I tried, I tried so hard <laughs> to relax. At about 20 minutes in, I'm just sitting up and they're, oh, they're having all these amazing transformative experiences. I'm sitting there going, yep. But so imagine I, I felt, taking that into it, taking that breathing exercise into your Hitachi and your oh, I do that at home. No, I do ta so tantra. Is, so it's like I do that at home. Next level. But I but but she can breathe herself into an orgasm without t fully closed, without touching herself. I've seen her do it half a dozen times. It's not a party <laughs> trick. It's like, and she teaches it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's amazing. And you, who <laughs> me? Um, I don't know about. Breathing my way to orgasm. No, that's like I've tried. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm 45 years old, and I only in the last like two years um, discovered I could actually have like a hands-free cervical orgasm, and it's totally blown my mind. And I wish I could tell you how it happened, except for lots of um, the right partner, um, lots of extended, very meticulous, and like my, I mean my my partner is super into foreplay like his like oh poor oh, you he loves it he loves it. <laughs> i know he loves it he's like he could write a book um but i think like that i never thought that was really possible and i kind of thought like oh g spot on oh, none of that's real and i was always sort of like i know what it takes and um i just kind of like let go and like let it happen and now i'm just like that's the only kind of orgasm that i want to have oh, and God. so I'm a little bit like always chasing the dragon kind of thing. So I don't know. I mean, you probably know more about like, I keep wanting to ask my um, sexpert friends like it's yourself. Like, you. Shut what, me what the is fuck it? up. I don't know. Don't. Huh? So, there, so there's the there's pudendal nerve and the pelvic nerve. And so the, clearly your pelvic nerve is really getting a good workout, which is that deep <laughs> penetration. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. I don't know where the microphones are, but. See lots of hands raised. Hello, uh, my name is Callista. First of all, Dita, I adore you. You're amazing. Oh, nice boobs, by the way. Can I say <laughs> Thank that? Thank you. I can, all I can. I, it's I like brought them just out lit for really you. nicely over there. I love your boobs as well. Um, <laughs> so I had a recent experience um, over email where I'm producing my own food series right now, and in my email thumb picture now, I'm in a marabou dressing gown, laying in a bed of sprinkles, as one does, and. Um, <laughs> I had a, a gentleman who I was working with trying to get onto my show suggest that I have a more conservative picture. Mm -hmm. And my question is for everybody is, how would you handle yourself when you need to keep a professional relationship when someone, especially a man, is telling you how to handle your own sexuality and persona? I lost a grant. Um, I, I, raised, <laughs> I raised all the money for my first film on burlesque through grants, and I actually lost a grant because I made, I had a rock band in New York called Hot Lunch, and I directed this like short film and showed it at a party, and for some, somehow they're oppressed there, and they were like, Liz Goldwyn made porn. And I mean, I'd be, I'd love to make porn, actually. If someone wants to offer me a job, I'd love to do it. This was not porn. But I was told that I lost this grant because of the making sexually provocative material and because of the way I was dressed. And it was suggested to me by someone who I really respected, um, a writer, I really respect him, uh, won't name his name, told me that I should consider dress, dressing more buttoned up. And at first it shook my confidence and then I was like, fuck you. <laughs> I'm right, I mean, I've, I'm writing about women who have traditionally been shamed for their profession, who were burlesque strippers at the turn of the you know, 1920s to the 40s or prostitutes, and I should be able to dress how I want to dress and talk about what I want to talk about. So that would be, I think it's up to you to decide what's professional and what, what image of yourself you're presenting. But Yeah, I agree. I feel like we don't have to choose anymore, and we can reconcile you know, business and our sensuality. I just think I, my instant thought was like, you're, you know, I don't know much about your business, but in this day and age where everyone's doing everything, like be, you know, find your niche, find the thing that, you know, there's someone out there that's going to be like, yes, this is who I want to do business with. And not because, um, you know, they, you know, want to, you know, they're a, 
sexually turned on by your picture because they're like, yeah, you know, people like me. Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to look at that profile pic like, this is a person I want to work with. Yeah. This is somebody on my team, part of my squad. So I feel like more and more what we wear and how we present ourselves is just kind of like, you know, uh, attracting your tribe and people that are yeah. like, oh, I like that, attracting your tribe. And also only our authentic selves can be happy. So if you're happy in that marabou dressing gown in the bed of sprinkles, own that shit and be it. We have time for like three more questions, I think. Or the saying goes, they can stand in line to take a number to stand in another line to kiss your ass. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your great talk. Merci beaucoup, vous êtes merveilleux. Uh, my question is, yes, I know that if it's not consent, it's a crime. However, I'm concerned a little bit about the Me Too movement that we may become a too much sanitized society. I have been to some events, sort of in between artistic, no, you know, no while, and I see the difference how some of the men are, you know, cautious, uh, talk a little bit, and then afraid. they go away. Yes, thank you, afraid. And just for the record, I love compliments. I remember when I was in New Yes, why not? I was in New York City, and this blue color worker said, oh, my lady, you move so nice. You know, and I, so many men are telling me that they are afraid to give a compliment to a lady because they feel they may be harassed. So what do you suggest? Because I love compliments. Do you? <laughs> I want the men still giving me compliments until I'm 90 years old. Um, so the, the Me Too movement is really quite the thing. And I think that it does, it, it, it is not, it is not a continuum. There is boorish behavior and then there's criminal behavior. Drugging somebody, criminal. Putting hands on without permission, criminal. Um, using your frustrated sexuality to deny them work or equal opportunity, probably criminal. Being an asshole, <laughs> genetic. <laughs> No, no, not genetic. No, no, men are not genetically assholes. The culture makes them so because, again, we socialize men and women differently. I find that if you smile at, you can, a, you can speak first, and smiling will probably elicit a compliment. But what gets me is when I've always been fine with being cat called. I smile back, go thank you, and keep moving. I've never felt threatened or harassed or, or, or harmed by people yelling out in the street. They do it. I walk on, and it doesn't bother me. But I don't live in New York. You know, I'm not on my feet walking around New York ten, you know, six hours a day, seven days a week. It would probably get to you after a while. Um, so smile, you know, and if a guy, go up and talk to him first. And if he pays your comment, thank you very much. I mean, just keep being you. I do think that men are really afraid, and it pains me that we don't have spaces in our culture that are supportive of, of men, the way that we, we have those spaces and are creating those spaces now for women. I, um, I per with the sex ed, with what I'm trying to do, I really want to be inclusive of men in the conversation and make sure that we're actively working on discussing all of these things because men are vulnerable. I constantly have to remind my female friends, by the way, who are, in, who are heterosexual, that men are vulnerable too. Men have feelings. Um, you know, I, I just think how they, Nina they, started in the beginning talking about how young men are conditioned. That, you know, they have, to, they have to live up to these hyper unrealistic expectations of masculinity that are j super toxic. So we need, we need to give them a hand. We need to lift them up. Yes. And I have found in my lifelong search for consensual female partners that it really worked for me to find out what women wanted and learn how to do that well. It was crazy, and I started getting good at what I did. They started asking me back, and once I got my ego out of the way, well, she should want this. I, I, I want to do this to her, but she wants that. Okay, we'll do that. And once, I, once I got there, oh my gosh. So it's not impossible to find females, women to want to have sex with you because women like sex. So how do we help educate men better? And men can't do it among themselves. They do need interaction with women. 
um, to learn how to, to do this better. So ladies, if this individual man is not messing with you, don't dump on him. I mean, feminism is important, but finger poking and, wet and, 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 and scolding doesn't help. There's two ways to get the puppy to come to you. Get over here right now. Get, get over here. Get over here. First is, come on, puppy. Come on, puppy. Come on, puppy. All this said, though, Nina, I did get sexually harassed at a Women in Hollywood Times Up event during I'm Oscar I'm not surprised week. at all. This year. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, so, so, so for every guy who wants to do better, there's, there's someone who's still stuck in, in the past. So, in, But we're individuals dealing with individual men. So I can't get... So I may be angry at a lot of the things that, that are happening to women, but this individual man is not hurting me right now. And he doesn't deserve me to dump on him because Trump's a jerk. <laughs> I think we have time for two more questions. I see one, one right there. Sorry, I'm going by the usher. Is it okay? Hi. Okay, so in the beginning, um, you guys talked about like your first experience with like sexual education, but did any of you guys have like a really influential first time? And like, is, do you think the pressure around it is like legit? Because especially as like college students, there's just like so much like unnecessary pressure. I guess we would totally. say. We have many cherries to pop and many firsts. <laughs> So the first time a penis enters your vagina is, okay, that's the first of that. But I, I'll tell you what, it doesn't wear out, and you can have as much sex as you want. And the there's first no set, time, no orgasm. Yeah, there's the no, first the, time doesn't need to be what oh, the, the first culture time tells I, you the first time So you is. had a great, the, my first time, after my first intercourse, I said to myself, and I quote, they write songs about this? <laughs> but, but wait, that wasn't my first intercourse. I had intercourse like before that, but it was just kind of like unmentionable. It didn't yeah. get good until I had like a proper partner where I could be like, oh, let's try this, let's try that. So, it, you know, so if I didn't even mention the first few because it was sort of like, yeah. what else, right. you know? So the, so <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So um, just because you had an, and, and, you know, sex can be awkward and stupid and and embarrassing and oh my god and but it's still a fun thing that adults get to do. It's adult play. It's where you get to feel silly and goofy and role play, cops and robbers, all the fun things that we did as kids with sex added. It's way fun. I want to try that cops and robbers thing <laughs> later. Wow, well, you have to explain that one oh, to me. Oh, officer, <laughs> am I gonna go to but the jail? robbers part? <laughs> what must I do? Okay, nominated. <laughs> Do you though? <laughs> Call it out. Okay. Come on. Do I don't need a mic. <laughs> I have the mic. <laughs> I'm Edward Lee Goldstein. I am a health educator. I wrote a book, The Male Thing Explained Secrets of an Orgasmic Urban Baby Boom. Okay. I agree 100% in terms of consensual sex with adults. There is no right or wrong. There is no gender, it's whatever you do that is not harming another person that is consensual. Harming them psychologically or physically. Uh, the question I have has to do with pornography online, or it's actually a statement. The challenge is children are going online and finding porno sites. The challenge is some of them are finding the kinky porno sites. And this is their first initiation into sexuality and they are getting a distorted view as to what sex is and acting out on it among each other so how do we contain that how do we control you can't put you cannot put the internet back in the box um, so um, again it's not porn's problem that people get to it who sh would might otherwise need to wait a bit therefore pre pre pornographic exposure conversation and information with the, with the family caregivers so that you can say, sweetheart, the stuff on the internet you might understand might be upsetting. Please come talk to me when you see it. And I want to, you know, oh, and also I tell people that, tell kids, porn is like, it's like live action cartoons for grown-ups, like Transformers <laughs> or, or Infinity War. It's not real. Because, because, of low, because of lousy sex education, because the genitals are actual genitals actually touching each other, it, they cannot stop to think that Everything else about it is artificially created, as I mentioned earlier. So 
Sweetheart, there's all kinds of things on the internet. Don't believe everything you see on the internet. If you see something with naked people, that's for grown-ups, and it isn't for you. Drinking's not for you. Cigarettes aren't for you. You know, methamphetamine's not for you, and porn, <laughs> and porno's not for you, right? It's it's for grown-ups, and um, and you can ask me any questions, but it's for grown-ups. I'd rather you not look at it. But you're not and in also, trouble. Also, if we're gonna get into it, guns are causing a lot more harm oh, in hey. our country. Oh, hey! Oh, come on! A little online you, pornography, but you. We won't go there tonight. I see one more question. My name is Inka. I don't know who Inka is. Um, I just fell in love with the three of you. You're awesome. Thank you for, you know, being you. Um, <laughs> I just started making erotica by Women for Women. Um, it's all real sex. Um, I just talked about it today on the Savage Love Cast. Yay. And so, Liz, if you want to make porn, I would always have you. <laughs> I'm dying to. I've been wanting to do it for years. Um, no one's asked me. I, I direct, have, to direct me. behind the camera. Right, oh, to get I direct. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you want to be in it, please. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> well, we can talk. Two stars. <laughs> I'll be the stylist. <laughs> you be the best stylist. <laughs> you can do the lighting. Yeah. Yeah. Lighting and stuff. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it.